Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service this morning um, at Second Cumber. And whether, you, if, whether you're working or worshipping with us here in the Meeting House or online, we do give you a warm welcome. Uh, visitors are most welcome to our service this morning as well. Tea and coffee will be available in the main hall at the close of the service, down to our right. And uh, prayer will be available in the committee room, that's up the stairs at the top, at the end of the service, should anyone wish to avail of that. So we thank you. Um, there's an, a couple of announcements. The first thing is junior Bible class will not be meeting this morning. It's on the announcement sheet that they are, but they will not be meet, meeting this morning. And uh, I have an announcement from PW. that The PW dinner that was scheduled to be this Wednesday has changed and now won't be happening until Wednesday the 8th of May in McBride's. Any ladies, and it's open to all ladies in the congregation who are interested in, con uh, in attending, should contact Sarah or Liz uh, Hamilton. So thank you for that. Um, we give a very warm welcome to our pulpit this morning to the Reverend, very Reverend Do Dr. John Dixon, who is conducting our worship this morning. Uh, but we are very pleased to see Andrew here still with us for another day before he leaves uh, for his journey to Brazil. So we thank the Reverend Dixon for his um, preaching with us this morning. The only other announcement I have to make is one of sadness. Um, as you know, over this past couple of Sundays, the Reverend Andrew has intimated the death, the very sudden death abroad of Mr. David MacDonald. David's funeral will take place here in the church on Tuesday at 12 o'clock. And we extend to Maud, to David, Ben and Andrea, our very deepest sympathy at this time of great sadness. And now I'll just hand over to the Reverend Dixon to continue with this morning's worship. Thank you. I thank your clerk of session, Mary, for our very gracious words of welcome to uh, Cumber again this morning. It is indeed lovely to be with you. I want to thank your minister for his uh, trusting me with his pulpit again this morning. I consider it a rare privilege and a great responsibility. I am thrilled to know that the Kirk Session and Congregation are sending your minister to Recife and to Brazil to consolidate and establish further and develop further missionary links with the South American situation. And I hope and trust that his visit there will be a tremendous blessing to him and that he will be enabled to return to bless the congregation and that in turn the congregation will be enabled to bless the community 
and indeed the province, the island, and the entire world through this further expansion of their missionary vision. I had the privilege of visiting the church in Recife in 1999, and I know that it will be an experience that Andrew will treasure and be blessed by, and I trust indeed that he and his family will know the blessing of the Lord in these next weeks. We have gathered here that we might worship the living God this morning. Hear his word. Because Jesus ever lives, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely all who come to God through him. Because he ever lives to intercede for them. Let us unite our hearts and minds together in prayer as we come before him this morning. Lord Jesus Christ, having celebrated your death and glorious resurrection so recently, we remember your kindness to your disciples in appearing to them in everyday course of their lives over the 40 days after the resurrection to assure them that you had really risen. And we thank you for your gentle encouragement when they were slow to believe and for your readiness to answer their lingering questions. We praise you that at the end of that time, you ascended visibly to the glory from which you had come. But before that, you assured your disciples that you had gone to prepare a place for them and that in the meantime, you would not abandon them or forsake them especially as they risk their lives for you by testifying to your resurrection in a society that deemed such teaching literally to be seditious. And furthermore, you reminded them that while they were witnessing on earth, you were interceding for them in glory. And we rejoice today that before the throne of God above, we too have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for us. And our names are written on his hands, and our names are hidden in his heart. And we know that while in heaven he stands, no power can force us to depart. And basking in that blessing today, we come with praise and adoration on our lips and deep gratitude in our hearts. Lord Jesus, your investment in us is breathtaking. Your interest in us is mind-blowing. And it is that very goodness of God that leads us to repentance this morning. For over against your loving and giving and ongoing intercession for us daily, we see how unworthy we really are. And so we come humbly confessing our sins and shortcomings and asking for your full and free forgiveness. Assure every penitent soul this morning of your faithfulness to forgive and to cleanse from all unrighteousness, and thus cleansed and purified by the ministry of your Spirit in our lives. May we offer to you a sacrifice of worship that will bring joy to your heart and blessing to ours, and send us out into our world of uh, this afternoon and tomorrow to shed abroad your grace, your mercy, and your peace. This we pray in your precious name, and for your sake and glory alone. Amen. And so we affirm unitedly, Jesus is the name we honor. And after we have sung this together, uh, Bill Anderson will read to us from God's Word. Let us all unitedly worship as we sing to his praise. <clears throat> Yes, they pay the bubble of the rings, the highest and 
morning's reading is taken from John chapter 17, verses 13 to 23. And the first section of the passage for reading, uh, in this passage, Jesus prays for the disciples. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. And then our Lord goes on to pray for all believers. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in, in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you have sent me and have loved me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Bill. We continue worshiping the Lord as we bring not only our praises and our worship and our prayers, but as we bring our offerings to Him. The stewards will wait upon you for your tithes and offerings as we worship. in this moment of dedication, we would dare to use the words of another, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. For thy mercy's sake, amen.
Now, boys and girls, we come to your special part in our morning worship. I'm going to come down to the front, and I invite you to come to the front and meet with me there. Till they come. Are your holidays all over? Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? So you've got back to school now? No. Not over yet? You still think you're on holidays? Why did you have a holiday in recent days? Easter. Easter. That's right. What do you remember about Easter, and what to you is most important about Easter? Jesus died on the cross to forgive our sins. Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive our sins, yes? And rose from the dead. And Jesus rose again from the dead, that's right, yes. Anything else, yes? He died on Easter and rose again. That's right. Well, you've got the real message. I thought you'd be telling me about Easter eggs and bunnies and daffodils and things like that. You're very spiritual here in Cumber. Isn't that, <laughs> isn't that fabulously wonderful? Not fabulously wonderful. Well, then if I ask you other questions about Jesus Christ, I'm sure you'll know and understand, you see, because we speak lovingly about Jesus Christ, and we say we love him because of all that he has done for us. And uh, you have told us so well that he died on Calvary's cross. He came as a baby to Bethlehem. He lived for 30 years, and then he died on the cross of Calvary, and then he rose again, and then he appeared this day, this Sunday, back after the first Easter, he would have been appearing to his disciples. He just came and went, and he wanted to reassure them that he actually was alive. Because do you know of anybody else that has died and risen again, and walked about on the earth? No. no. Well, God in Jesus Christ, that's right. It's spectacular. It's the one and only time it has ever happened in history. And that's why we worship him, because he is so wonderful. But you see, he died, and the disciples in the upper room were a wee bit concerned, because they knew he was going to go away from them. They said, we, we have been with you for three years, and if you go away from us, you're going to forget us. But he said to them, no, 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 no. Listen, I'm going away because I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I prepare that place for you, I'm going to come back and receive you to myself. But in the meantime, I want you to go out and I want you to tell other people about the fact that I loved you, that I came, that I died on Calvary's cross, that I rose again. And it wasn't going to be easy. But he said, when I go back to heaven, I am going to be remembering you. You see, sometimes we say that out of, out of sight, out of mind, don't we? And I think the disciples had a bit of a feeling of that, the thoughts. And if Jesus Christ is out of sight and back in heaven, he'll forget all about us on earth. But you know, he hasn't done so. And this is quite spectacular. And I want you to take this in. It's nearly as amazing as the fact that he rose again. Jesus is praying for us as we meet in Cumber this morning in heaven. Do you believe that? It's true. And you know, I'll tell you something else. He knows your name. Now, I don't know your names. And who, who all would know your name, generally speaking? Yes? Well, God would know your name. That's, that's right. That's what I'm going to emphasize to us. That is important, yes? Your parents? Uh -huh. Your parents will know your name. Your brothers, your sisters, your friends at school will know your name. Uh, the people that you play with, yes? Teachers. Teachers will know your name, yes? Families. Fa families, yes, they will know your name. BFFs, best friends ever. <laughs> best friends, sorry? Best friends ever. Oh, I see. BFFs, best friends ever. Oh, I'm not into this texting business. <laughs> You're too smart for me at your age, you know. Um, yes, well, there's only a certain limited group of people who know our name. But as you say, Jesus knows my name. Jesus knows your name. And he's praying for you. Now, you pray to him, I hope, every day. But isn't that amazing to know 
that he is also praying for you. I think that's mind-blowing. I hope your parents pray for you. I'm sure that your Sunday school teachers and, and organization leaders in church pray for you. I'm sure your minister prays for you and, and your elder of your district prays for you. And that's wonderful. But Jesus is praying for you. I find that amazing. Because who am I and who are you? We're rather small, insignificant, and unimportant as far as the world is concerned. But yet the one who created the world and Jesus Christ was there at the beginning when the world was made. The one who created the world and is reigning in glory at this moment knows you by name and he's praying for you. Never, ever forget that. So you may have days when you're sad and you remember, Jesus is praying for me. You may have days when you're glad and you thank him. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for praying for me. You may have days when it's difficult or days when it's uh, not so difficult at all. But in each and every day and every night, to know that Jesus knows you by name and that Jesus Christ is praying for you. And we're going to rejoice in the grandeur and the glory of that Jesus. As you have already said to me, he is nothing less than the creator God. And we're going to sing that together reminding ourselves that the one who knows us by name personally on that level is the one who flung the spinning orbs into space. That's mind-blowing. And that's why we rejoice. And that's why we glory in his grace. So we're going to sing that together. Creator God. I believe you depart for children's ministry in the main hall, and we trust that you will remember that that Creator God is none other than your friend Jesus, who knows you by name. And after the
apologies. And now Mary is going to lead us in our prayers of intercession for the world and the church. Let us pray. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we pray for your church around the world. You are a creator God who has made a beautiful world for us to live in. We pray for those who faithfully serve you in many countries and in differing situations. Those who have a vision for ministry, who help in dreadful and uh, circumstances throughout the world. We know the world is broken and fallen, and there are many places where we need your help. We implore for your help in those situations. But today, Lord, we wish to specifically play for our much-loved minister, Andrew, as he embarks on his mission trip to Recife in northeastern Brazil as part of his sabbatical, where he will partner with Paul Crothers, um, who's linked to Latin Link and ministers with the poor and disadvantaged advantaged young people in that area. This will be for Andrew a time of new horizons, new experiences, new friendships. As he begins his long journey to Brazil tomorrow, we earnestly pray he will know of your blessing and protection, that all travel arrangements may go to plan, and for his health, safety and well-being while he is there. Lord God, through this mission trip, may he serve and glorify you as he interacts and ministers to those he will encounter, both young and old, that it will be a time of much blessing and that he would know of your love and grace in every situation. We pray for Paul and his wife, Suze, as they prepare to welcome Andrew and be blessed with a time of fellowship together, impacting upon the lives of the young people in Recife, leading them to faith in you as Lord and Saviour. Lord, we pray that the gifts from Second Cumber sent out with our love and prayers will be used by you and be a blessing in the lives of these young people through the medium of sport, which has been so fruitful in Paul's ministry to them. Lord, we pray for Andrew's family while he is away, for Sarah as she manages the man's household, for Annie and Peter, and for Andrew's parents, those who will miss him the most. Grant them your blessing and protection. We thank you, Lord, as Andrew uses this time of sabbatical to serve you and further the ongoing work of your kingdom here on earth. He is excited about the trip and what the future may hold for the outreach and partnership from this congregation with those in Recife. We pray for your leading and guiding for the days ahead. We commit him into your safekeeping and pray he may return to us renewed and refreshed as he serves you Father God, in this place. Heavenly Father, you are a loving, generous, compassionate God in whose name we ask these prayers and, for his, and in his sake we ask the, and say Amen. We will now sing, we will now sing um, Salvation Belongs to Our God as our third item of praise.
It is recorded of Leonardo da Vinci that when he was about to paint the fresco of the Last Supper, he prepared himself by prayer and meditation. Yet when he raised his brush to give expression to his devout thoughts, we are told that his hand trembled. Such an attitude of holy reverence becomes anyone who would approach the scenes in the upper room. And as we listen in to Jesus Christ praying in the upper room, as read for us by Bill from John chapter 17, we too need to come with our reverence because we are standing on holy ground. It had already been a very awesome experience for Peter and James and John and Thomas and Bartholomew. Jesus had washed their feet. Then he had shared the Last Supper with them. He proceeded to answer their questions, to comfort and to challenge them. And then he turns to pray. It's an audible prayer because John later recalls it and records it in this chapter. And there are three distinct sections in the prayer. In verses 1 to 5, he prays for himself. In verses 6 to 19, he prays specifically for the 12 disciples. And then in verses 20 to 26, he prays for all believers. I wish to focus our thoughts today on two facts that I hope will be heard by you and will be gripped in your mind for good. First of all, that Jesus prays for the church. And secondly, what it is that Jesus prays for the church. First of all, what Jesus prayed for the church. Who would blame Jesus had he ended his prayer at the end of verse 5, when he had been speaking about his own needs and asking his Father for strength and grace? But he does continue, and he pours out his heart for his 12 disciples, and he goes beyond that. Those present must have grasped as they heard him say, I have revealed you, Father, to those that you gave me out of the world. They are yours and you gave them to me. And they have obeyed your word, verse 6. And then verse 9, I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those that you have given me, for they are yours. I wonder, have you been privileged to listen to other people audibly praying for you. I want to say to you that it is an awesome experience and it is a great privilege. My Kirk Session used to meet every Monday night to pray and always at least one elder would have taken the responsibility for praying in detail for me and my ministry for that incoming week. And every Sunday morning in the congregational prayer meeting it became routine for a member to pray for me before I left to go to prepare to lead morning worship. So I think I know a little about how Peter and John must have felt that night. But this was no mere man who is praying. This is Jesus, the Creator God, the Son of God. And Dr. Luke tells us that Jesus turned specifically to Peter and said, listen, Satan desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. How humbling and how, how reassuring it must have been to Peter that Jesus had specifically prayed for him by name. Jesus prayed for me. I can sense Peter thinking that. And maybe we're thinking, wow, that was for them. If only he had prayed for me. But I have good news for you. He did. See verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. That is Peter and James and John. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. How have you come to believe in Jesus Christ? by the Word of God passed on to us through the apostles for whom Jesus was praying. Isn't that amazing? Jesus prayed in the upper room for all in world history 
who would come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. That night, before he went out to die for you, he prayed for you. I've even more exciting news. Jesus prays present tense for you. You do not have to make do with historical reality, uh, that of Jesus praying in the upper room for you years ago. It is a holy responsibility the Savior has assumed since ascending to glory. Listen to those words in Hebrews 7, uh, 24, 25. Because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely all those who come to God through him. Why? Because he always lives to intercede for them. In my youth, we had not one but two paraphrases of this passage, paraphrase number 57 and 58 in the old Presbyterian hymnal that many of you will, like myself, be old enough to remember. But now we have a modern paraphrase in him. 492, which is really glorious. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is written on his hands. My name is hidden in his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no power can bid me thus depart. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grasp that glorious reality today. Rest in his love and rejoice in the fact that as you meet to worship here this morning, Jesus is praying for you. Robert Murray McShane was a Church of Scotland minister in uh, Dundee, and he left a legacy of spiritual revival there despite dying at the age of 29. And he wrote, if I could hear Jesus praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. What a difference that would make in our lives if we really took it and allowed it to percolate through our thinking and understanding that moment by moment, day by day, Jesus is praying for me. But the second question, what is it that he's praying for me? When we learn to answer that question, it will help us in two ways. It will enable us to examine our thinking, our acting, and our living against the goals that Jesus Christ is asking the Father to produce in us. His petitions reflect His expectations that He has for us as His children as we live and walk and work around the Cumber area. And secondly, it will act as a template to enable us to pray for his church in accordance with his will for the church. So what are the burdens of Christ's prayer for us and his church? Well, first of all, he prayed that we should be joyful. When last did you hear anyone in a prayer meeting pray that the believers should be filled with joy? Beloved in the Lord, I believe it's really not on our radar. However, it is the first concern of Jesus Christ. In verse 13, he pleads with his Father that they might have the full measure of my joy within them. Despite the context where Jesus was going out to Gethsemane and Calvary, Jesus asks that joy may characterize his followers. This is because joy is a gift from God. Earlier in the upper room, Jesus affirms, verse 11 of chapter 15, I've told you this, that my joy may be in you, and therefore your joy may be complete. And he goes on to reassure them that your grief will turn to joy, and I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. 
This joy of which I speak is a gift to Jesus, from Jesus to his people. They are filled with joy because they remember that he died for them, that he rose again, that he is indeed interceding for them. But this joy is not only a gift from Jesus, it's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Jesus prays that his disciples might produce the fruit of the Spirit. Now, this is not to be confused with a superficial hilarity or jocular attitude at everything. It is <clears throat> a divine gift and a spiritual fruit that should characterize the people of God living as we are in a pretty joyless society. Such joy fills the non-believer with envy as they seek joy in all the wrong places and end up more disillusioned and dissatisfied than they were to begin with. And I'm sure if you think of it, you can think of many of your work colleagues and friends and neighbors who are in that situation, endlessly searching for joy and satisfaction and following cul-de-sacs that lead them only into greater distress and despair. I, I love the story of a gentleman I know. He's now a minister of the gospel. At 17 years of age, he decided to go his own way, live his own life, and he went into a relationship that would not have been honoring to the Lord. And he lived in that for some seven, eight years. And uh, he and his friend were living in a first floor flat overlooking the exit of a large church in the south of England every Sunday morning as they were there. Their lives increasingly empty, having failed to find the joy they sought in that which they were pursuing. And you know what unsettled them? The sight of the believers spilling out of that building. He couldn't get it out of his head. They had the joy he was looking for. It started him off on a search that led him to find Christ and led him to Bible college and into the ministry today. Beloved in the Lord, there are scores, hundreds of acquaintances searching for joy in their pretty drab and dreary lives in our Northern Irish society today, are we the people of God, the catalyst to show them the joy that Jesus brings and the joy that the Holy Spirit can produce in us? Jesus is praying that it should be so. Secondly, Jesus prays that they be protected in the world. Verse 15, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Believers are not to be uh, isolated from the world, but we're to be insulated in it. Three things that we may deduce from Christ's petition. Jesus wants his people to be in the world, but not of it. Sometimes holy people in history became monks or hermits and isolated themselves from ordinary society. Clearly, Jesus prays against that tendency. However, secondly, he does warn the disciples, the world hates you in all generations. Listen to his words to the Father in verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. Beloved in the Lord this morning, do not be dismayed and do not be unsettled when the world hates you. It hated Christ before you. It will hate you too, even without a cause. And Jesus recognizes that all true followers of his will face temptation and will face trial and testing. He knew that Peter would be tested and tried, and so he assures him, Satan desired to have you that he might test you, but I have prayed for you 
that your faith will not fail. What a promise to realize that when we too face that testing, He is praying for us. And what a blessing to us to have His promise given in 1 Corinthians 10. No temptation or test has sealed you except what is common to man. And God is faithful, and He will not let you be tested beyond what you are able to bear. But when you are tempted, He will provide a way out so that you can stand up against it. While all of us face tempting, temptation and testing, there are two groups that I want to highlight this morning. First of all, members of Presbyterian Church in Ireland who go to work in the town square, in the world of business, retail, leisure, medicine, teaching, politics. Everyday employment is littered with temptations and tests for the believers as peers pressure and pragmatism triumphs over truth. There was a conference being held in First Antrim one day, and my accountant happened to be there, and I, I, I spoke to her and thanked her for the great generosity and kindness she had shown towards me. And, and I said, if there's anything I can ever do for you, uh, please tell me. She said to me, will you pray for me? She said, I belong to a large evangelical church, as she di indeed did in Belfast. And she said, they never pray for me. They pray for Sunday school teachers, and they pray for missionaries, and they pray for ministers, and they pray for elders, but they never pray for accountants. It taught me an excellent lesson. And secondly, our youth. This generation is born into and growing up in a society that has lost its moorings in our biblical heritage, swamped in a sea of relativism. They struggle to find a moral compass or a value system that can help them navigate life in all its fullness. Let us unite with Christ to intercede for them. Those of us who are over 40 cannot easily understand the pressures our young people and our teenagers are facing today. Let us, as elder and more mature brothers and sisters in Christ, surround them, sustain them, and support them in prayer as never before. Thirdly, Jesus prays that the people of God should be consecrated. Now, consecration is another word for sanctified or made holy or set apart for holy use. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. And since Jesus Christ uses the same word in verse 19 and affirms, I sanctify myself, I suggest that Jesus is asking the Father to set his people apart for holy use in society. And what is the means that God has given us to achieve that end? His Word. This is the positive side of the previous petition. Jesus prays that His disciples will not only be kept from yielding to temptation and falling before the test, but that they will be confirmed in the truth. They need to be saved from the testing, but saturated by the truth. Now, in the 21st century, many ask, what is truth? We are bombarded by a torrent of information, disinformation, misinformation on mainstream as well as social media. So much so that determining what and who we can trust is incredibly difficult. The believer, however, is not left in such an uncertain place. They have been given an infallible, objective, and trustworthy divine revelation. As Jesus Christ put it when praying to the Father, He said, Your word is truth. And the point of His petition is this, Holy Father, make your people holy through your truth. Set them apart from the world and society around them so that their thoughts and their words and their deeds begin to reflect your character re revealed in your word that is read and studied and understood and obeyed and lived out in everyday life and experience. Thus, they will be sanctified. They will be set apart for holy use and for holy purposes and for holy service. Jesus further prayed that his disciples should be mission-minded. Uh, he continues in verse 18, As you, Father, sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. As a fire exists by burning, so a church exists by mission. 
Some years ago, the old uh, Board of Mission in Ireland urged and encouraged Irish Presbyterian congregations to grasp the vision of creating vibrant local communities of Christ, serving and transforming Ireland. Their vision reflected that of Christ in that the local congregation should so communicate Jesus that others would inevitably be drawn to it. Now, all the pictures of the church in the New Testament are positive, they're dynamic, they're exciting. Picture of a bride in such love with her bridegroom that she beautifies and presents herself as a stunning vision, causing all to see her exclaim, wow, how lovely you look. A body fed, exercised, cared for responsibly so that it is able, active, and attractive to serve the desires of the Lord. Pilgrims, a group not settled down here as if it was their eternal home, but traveling joyfully onward towards the home that Jesus has gone to prepare for them. An army, a disciplined body of soldiers on active service, following their commander-in-chief, wielding the sword of the Spirit, conquering in Christ's name, and establishing truth and justice and righteousness. But does that ring true of the church in Ireland today? A Seneca suggested that our congregations are more like fossils hidden away in muse museum-like buildings, tortoises, moving slowly because we're so resistant to change, spluttering candles, giving promise of light, but burning so dimly that few can actually see the way. Cozy clubs focused on keeping those inside happy and undisturbed while showing no care for those outside who desperately know, need to know of and find Christ. I'm so thrilled to hear that you're sending your minister uh, to a continent he has not yet visited so that you and he and this congregation might be livingly involved in holding hands and partnership with the Church of Jesus Christ in that land. And I trust that the expansion of your vision will be pleasing to the Lord and a benediction and a blessing to you. In 1984, when I was trying to move our United Midweek into home Bible study groups, uh, I used an illustration of a stool, a three-legged stool, saying, what are these groups for? They're to learn to understand the Word of God. They're to learn to pray together, and they're learn to learn to share fellowship and grow together in love. After some years, uh, discontent began to arise, and it came to the ears of the session, and we looked at it and thought about it and prayed about it, and we discovered this, that the illustration I had used and the pattern we had given to them in 1984 was inadequate. The stool needed four legs, because when we study the Word and when we pray and when we grow together in fellowship, there must be an outflow in mission. And that's precisely what we did. And that led to schools being built in Asia, uh, to neighbors who were in the workplace being brought into the fellowship of Jesus Christ and brought to know him, etc., etc. If we are simply studying and praying and fellowshipping together without being mission-minded in reaching out into Cumber or Columbia, then we are not fulfilling the ambition and the desire of Jesus Christ for his church. Jesus prays that his disciples would be united, verses 21 and 20. I pray for those who will believe in me that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. There is here more than a, a mere comparison between the unity of all God's children and the oneness of the persons of the Trinity. The oneness between the Father and the Son is not merely a model of this unity. It is the only foundation that makes true unity between people possible. Only those individuals who have been born from above and are in the Father and in the Son can experience and express this oneness because it is an organic spiritual relationship with the living God. 
born of God by the work of the Holy Spirit. Believers are incorporated into the family of God and accepted, expected to relate lovingly as brothers and sisters in Him. But that, as we know, is not always so. In the most positive and upbeat letter in the New Testament, Paul writing to his church at Philippi, he has to plead with two fellow workers to be as one. I plead with Iodias, I plead with sympathy to agree with each other in the Lord. Oh, the enemy of God's church loves to sow division between believers and shatter the unity that Christ desires and pleads for. Let us not ever allow him to do that. Let us rather listen to God's Word as He exhorts us to be like-minded, having the same my love, being one in spirit and purpose, to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility of mind consider others better than ourselves. Each of us should look not only to our own interests, but to the interests of others. Our attitude should be that of Jesus Christ. Throughout my entire ministry, I think I can honestly say I fear division and selfishness and strife more than most other things because little does more to destroy the witness and the testimony of a congregation and little does more to destroy the joy and the love and the fellowship and the embrace of brothers and sisters in Christ. And Jesus prays against it. Beloved in the Lord, let us strive by every fiber of our being to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, if Jesus Christ is praying for us that you and I should be joyful, protected, consecrated, mission-minded, and united, then I hope and trust that we will be found as those believers who are faithfully doing that. And if Jesus Christ is praying that for His church, then I trust that we will make these central petitions in our corporate times of prayer that will take us beyond the often very small-minded petitions we often offer and plead with God to fulfill the prayer of Jesus in the upper room. Let's pray. Lord, in your mercy, eradicate from the minds of all who have heard me or will hear me anything that has merely been of man. But insofar as I have faithfully shared what the Holy Spirit wanted this dear people to hear, anchor that truth deeply in every heart and mind and profoundly impact this congregation. This link in Brazil, this world, with your grace, because we pray it in your precious name. Amen. Our concluding praise is the hymn 492 in the Irish Presbyterian hymnal. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea.
And now to him, him who is able, able to keep you from falling, to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority, through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.